December 29th, and that means only one thing, the O'Reilly and Constant Show, presented by the SportsCast. If you haven't yet, please subscribe on all of our channels, YouTube, Periscope, and iTunes. If you're on iTunes, please leave a rating and review. Also, visit us on the sportscast.net for all of the up-to-date sports news. This episode is brought to you by Zach White, realtor, LAH Homewood in the Birmingham area. Many of you know Zach as someone who's actively been helping kids learn sports and life lessons through soccer shots, wish to enrich, and our kids' ministries. Well, now Zach has a new way to serve others through LAH Real Estate. If you or someone you know is looking for a home or needing to sell, call Zach at 205-381-7050. I'm your host, Over the Hill Powerlifter and 2003 Bama grad, Justin Riley. With me, as always, is a man who could single-handedly take down John Cena is the reason for former SEC quarterbacks having night terrors, and he's an accomplished author. Everybody, welcome in Marvin Constant. Hey, hey, roll tide. Thank you, thank you. Roll tide. Oh, absolutely, man. Well, before we uh, start talking about some Bama, man, tell me about this wild weekend in the SEC. What are some things that stood out to you? One of the things that stood out to me most this weekend was the struggles that Georgia was actually having the first half with with Arkansas. You know, for me, that didn't quite look right. But, you know, Coach Smart was able to go to halftime, make adjustments and come out and lay it on heavy in the second half. And they were able to get things turned around. So by far, I'll say that struggle along with Texas A&M struggle with Vandy. Wow. it's Vandy. How do you struggle with it? I get it. It's week one, you know, no spring practice. It was a long layoff, but it's still at the end of the day, it's Vandy. Pink <laughs> locker room, Vandy. Okay. So for All those right. of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the visitors locker rooms at Vandy are painted pink. Okay. I guess that's wow. one of the tactics they use to neutralize or lack thereof neutralization because it never seems to really work because they can keep it. <laughs> What do you think that uh, why that happened was Texas A&M looking ahead? Was Derek Mason just able to get the group uh, rolling, or is it because they have several players out, or A&M that is had several players out uh, due to uh, opting out and then some injury? Ah, uh, I'm gonna say it's due to who they had on the schedule coming up this Saturday. You know, I I think you know a lot of times guys they look ahead for games. You know, and when you yeah. look ahead you know, you tend to let lesser opponents sneak up on you. So I'm going to say maybe, just maybe, they were looking ahead to the Bama game and not as focused on Vandy as they should have been. So that's what I'm going to go out on a limb and say. But the inner me wants to say, they just suck. But hey. <laughs> hey, we can accept that answer here on the, our show. There's nothing wrong at all. Uh, next big game, uh, Ole Miss looked pretty good in their debut. Lots and lots of offense. A uh, few key mistakes led to their downfall, but overall, Lane Kiffin had his uh, boys ready to play. I was impressed with what I saw, but Kyle Trask and Kyle Pitts, the tight end, were just way too much for him. What did you learn from that game? I learned that Florida's All-American tight end is going to be a matchup nightmare all season for whoever he plays. So, yeah. you know, you better game plan for that. You know, you're going to have to take him away and look at other options on that offense in order for you to stop them, you know, you take him away, they got to figure out something else because he appeared to be, you know, the bulk of who the quarterback was looking for the entire time. So. Yeah, absolutely. And then moving on to the other part of the state, uh, Mississippi state, perhaps the, the wildest uh, game in the entire weekend, able to beat LSU. And, you know, let's go ahead and say LSU was depleted, had a lot of players that were absent due to the draft, had, coordinators leave but it's still LSU at the end of the day they've got the talent there and Mississippi State put on an absolute air raid clinic what did you see there you see my face right you I see do me. see your face I'm just trying to sound like I'm an unbiased no. sports reporter <laughs> This is what happens when you compare yourself to Alabama. This is what happens when you say you're the giant slayer. Okay, you get lucky one year and you beat us, which was the first time you beat us since, what, 2011? Hmm, okay. Yeah. So 
you got lucky, you got your one little win, you know, quarterback was hurt. You so now you come back and you all you want to talk about is the players who opted out, this, that, and the third. If it were Alabama, nobody would care who opted out. Because at the end of the day, all they care about is you got all these four and five star recruits. How do you replace people and keep it moving? So apparently somebody dropped the ball. <laughs> Okay, biggest one-year wonder, Sir Mix-a-Lot or LSU? LSU, hands down. <laughs> I hear you, man. Okay, now it's time to talk about Alabama. But before we do that, we got to bring our guest on to help us out with a little bit of the uh, diagnosis of what we saw. So last week, you know, we had some of the best players up front defensively and then Big Sam offensively. This week, our attention turns to one of the best to ever carry the ball. Can you please introduce our guest? All right. Our guest, ladies and gentlemen, he was an all-SEC running back at the University of Alabama. What more can you say? You know, he went on to play in the NFL. So, you know, he's he's good from you know, jump cuts, jumping out of airplanes, mm -hmm. however, anything related to jumping, he's got you covered. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, Glenn Coffee. What's going on, Glenn? A little bit of delay. He's coming. A little dramatic entrance. All right, there he is. What's going on, Glenn? Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me, man. How you doing? Hey, man. it's a pleasure. Oh, tired, brother. What's up, man? How you doing? How you doing? Man, I'm good. No complaints, man. Just yeah. happy football season is back on the table. Absolutely. I'm pretty excited. Uh, before we get started, Glenn, I heard you were a powerlifting champion in high school. Uh, is that true? Yeah, it is. I, 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 won, uh, I won state in high school. Well, I, I've been a powerlifter for almost all my life, so naturally this intrigued me. I remember hearing about it. Either I read it in an article or I heard about it on one of the games the, the uh, announcers were talking about it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I, I got to fit this in somehow because that's kind of what I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we are a fitness show because Marvin's got this great book and he's one of the leading experts in fitness. So this kind of, you know, interlocks. Uh, yeah. Uh, in my area, we started lifting weights uh, at a pretty, pretty high intensity, probably starting in sixth grade. And um, so I knew how to clean, snatch, jerk, all that at that age. And I just, I don't know. A lot of it is technique. You know, um, I am a strong person, but a lot of it was just having the technique from an early age. I got you. Well, cool, man. Uh, glad to have that connection. All right, guys, let's get to the game. Uh, opening weekend SEC, but we all know it didn't really start until Alabama kicked off, right? <laughs> so we had a great opening win, beat Missouri 38-19. to uh, What was your first take? Glenn, we'll start with you. Um, I didn't, I didn't get to watch the game. I was working, but I caught the highlights. Uh, to me, it looked like they were trying to run the ball. And, um, and I, I feel like – I'm not going to say they're trying to bring the old Alabama back, but I feel like they're trying to find a new identity um, on both offense and defense. Uh, I think people should expect a lot out of, um, out of uh, Matt uh, because he has a lot of quality and he has a lot of gifts. And um, I know people are, are high up on – what's the freshman name? I don't, I don't watch a whole bunch of football. Bryce Young. Bryce. They're, they're, they're very high on Bryce, and a lot of people are expecting him to maybe um, take the starting job this year, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but back to what I said in the beginning, I think, uh, I think if, we, if we find an identity early on in the season, I think it'll be um, something that we can build upon. So, I mean, they, they look good, but like I said, you can't really give a, a true description of a game unless you actually watch the whole game, only caught the highlights. But from that, I feel like we were trying to uh, bring back a little bit of the old Alabama. Marvin, what was your take well, based on what you saw? Um, which version of this story do you want first? I want, the Mar <laughs> I want the Marvin Constant version because that's the best version. <laughs> I was highly disappointed. Oh, man. Are you talking about giving up two scores to the end? Exactly. We didn't finish. Okay. We didn't Thank you. To finish, you know, because we jumped out on them early. 
and then we allow them to score these points at the end and make it look closer than it really was. You know, if you're going to be a championship caliber team, you got to play from the first whistle to the last. So whether it's the first team, second team on the field, it has to be a level of consistency. It seemed like once we came out of halftime, that level of consistency dropped. And, you know, again, as a championship team, you have to be solid and consistent across the board. So, you know, because what we scored one time in the second half, I think. Uh, once in a field, field goal. You know, I was actually extremely pleased that we made a field goal. Go, hey, you know, so <laughs> was like, oh my God, we won a lot. <laughs> field goal. People don't understand, man. You know, being from Alabama and Alabama, field goal kicking is like the most noticeable point in any game for me. It's like, I am shook. <laughs> Because it's like, <laughs> miss it. I'm not even going to watch. Yeah. Well, you bring up a very good point, and that's one of the talking points I was going to bring up, uh, was the fact that we gave up two touchdowns uh, towards the end. And, and a lot of people are saying, uh, you're, you're focused on the wrong thing. That was garbage time. Actually, no, you got to finish. And that's one of the things that Saban will jump on is finishing games. And here's another thing. You know, what if some of the starters get hurt? What if we start losing players due to COVID and they had to sit out? Well, those are the guys who are going to take the field. So that has me concerned that they're not able to finish. So uh, I know I got a lot of flack from non-Alabama fans who really don't understand the game, but that was pretty huge to me. Yeah, you, you, you got to finish. You know, you can't go out there, whether you're second or third or fourth team. If you're going to play, there's a standard that you have to live up to. And, you know, I don't think we lived up to that standard second half. I really. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Of course, the big three, Mac Jones, Najee Harris, and Jalen Waddle had a combined seven touchdowns. How does that set the tone for the rest of the season? And what are you guys expecting from them? Uh, from them? Uh, I'll start with you, Glenn. Um, you know, when I first got to Bama, I was, you know, I was up there for a little bit. Um these past couple of years ago. Um, and when I was first around Matt, it seemed like he wanted to enjoy college as much as he wanted to be a great quarterback, mm -hmm. you know? But whenever, for instance, one time he, uh, he got in trouble, right? And when he would be on the scout team offense, he wouldn't always give his all. But this particular time, he had gotten in trouble, and I guess he had a chip on his shoulder, and the defense could not stop him. You know, he had scout team offense, scout team O-line, scout team receivers, and throughout the whole practice, he was probably 80% completion percentage. I mean, on a dime, right? Just because he was mad. So I think if you have that, that Mac playing um, this whole season – you know, he's had a whole offseason to, to say I'm the starting quarterback. If he goes in with that confidence, then uh, then I think people would be surprised with what he can do. Um, Najee, Najee is uh, – his potential is through the roof. I still don't think he's reached his full potential. A lot of people like to go back to high school and say, you know, look at what this guy did in high school. I don't think that's fair. But in his case, I think the high school Najee – can be the same level of a wild factor in college. And I think he has the potential to have that, to carry on that same wild factor in the NFL. Um, and then who was the, who you said big three, who was the third one? Jalen Waddle. Waddle. Um, I mean, that, that says enough. I mean, you don't even have to really talk yeah. about it. You know, uh, he's obviously one to barring injury. And barring anything happening off the field, which I don't see happening, he's going to, he can, I mean, he has Hall of Fame talent right now. Now, obviously, you got to put in that work. Obviously, you got to, you got to um, keep your body in shape. You know, you, you got to do certain things, but his, his talent and his ability is, is you see him in person and you're like, I might not, I might not ever see that again, you know? And so that's what he brings. That's what he brings to the table. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't think this is a year of stars for Alabama. I think this is a year of uh, building a foundation, as I said before, finding an identity and really just bringing their lunch pails to work. You know, I don't think, I really don't think we should be talking national championship. 
I don't think we should be talking SEC. When when first said when Coach Saban first got to Alabama, he never mentioned the SEC championship. He never mentioned a national championship. He laid a foundation first, and then we came to expect those things. It didn't really have to be spoken about like that. And I think this year is Alabama. I think they're in the process of uh, saying, you know, this is us. This is who we are, and then and they have to go out and show that, you know, and prove it. Marvin, what are your thoughts on the big three and how it sets the tone for the season? I think Glenn touched on a um, great point in the fact that finding their identity, you know, after the way last season ended, the team has to figure out a way to put everything, put all the pieces back together. How do you get back to being the dominant force that you once were? So, and it starts with those three guys on offense, along with that offensive line, which by most experts' opinions, which is the best offensive line in the country. So if you have the best offensive line in the country, that means you should be running the ball with authority. Yeah. That means mm. Your opponents shouldn't stand a chance. And if you can run the ball well with Najee and, and Brian, that's going to set you up to play action pass with Mac. So that's only going to make him more successful in the long run. So I think he played a solid game at quarterback. You know, he hit some very nice throws. He was very consistent. He didn't make bad decisions. He wasn't rushing, you know, so that's always a plus. You don't want a quarterback who gets nervous back there because if you have a nervous quarterback, it's never going to end well. And again, Najee played a solid game. But when it comes to Jalen, that's just a completely different ball game. That is <laughs> I'm going to get you the ball as many ways as I can because I know every time you touch the ball, it's a high probability you're going to go do something spectacular with it. So, you know, I think our three of them played extremely well, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they gel. And I'm looking forward to seeing that offensive line become more dominant. Oh gosh. I want to see that line dominant like when we had DJ Fluka, James Ooh. Carpenter, Come on. Quanjo, all those monsters up front. Yes, That's Lord. the type of line I want to <laughs> And it has that feel. We just got a small taste of what the offensive line could do this past Saturday night. I don't know if you noticed, but they did not allow a single sack against Matt Jones. Did not let any man touch them. I don't, uh, maybe like late at the ball had been thrown, but there was not a single sack. So, yeah, this group is solid, and they can only get uh, better from here. All right, now well, we got to bring up – go ahead. They, they, they better be solid because, again, you have 10 SEC games this year. The last thing you want is your quarterback getting hit repeatedly because I can guarantee you this. The people who are going to hit him from, from LSU, from Tennessee, from Auburn, from Georgia, they're going to hit him a lot harder than from those those little non-conference games we normally play. That's yeah. going to add up. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the other side of the ball. I don't think there is – a player that people were more excited about as far as his return goes. And that was Dylan Moses, but also LeBron Ray. You know, how big was the return, not only Dylan, but LeBron to that defense? Glenn, I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you start. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, um, my man. <laughs> no, you good, you good. Uh, I don't know. I don't – I don't want to. I don't want to pretend like I watch a whole lot of football to, to talk on it. But um, I can speak to 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 Brian, LeBron, and 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 Dylan because I was there. Um, those are those are some good guys. You know, those are some quality guys. Those are some guys that you want to root for, and to see them be able to really take the reins and 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 say this is my defense. Um, I'm just happy for them to get that opportunity. You know. Uh, I know how Dylan got hurt, but how many games did – How what happened with LeBron last year? I think it was – it had to do something with his leg, I, either a foot or or, or knee. I, I can't quite remember. But, yeah, it, he was sidelined the entire year because of, I think he may have broken his foot. I had to yeah, go back yeah. and look, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll keep it short because I don't, I don't want to – I don't want to take the all thunder. But uh, – you're talking about two guys who you want to see succeed and you want to see have a chance to um to put their stamp on this season and just an Alabama legacy. Uh, those are some guys you really want to root for. Well, I know you didn't watch the or able to watch the game, but this is talk from a leadership standpoint, what it means having veterans like Dylan Moses, who will probably be a top 10 pick and LeBron Ray, who will more than likely be a first round pick as well. How right. important is having that leadership uh, facet in place? 
I think it's so much more important on defense um, than it is offense. You know, on offense, everybody looks to the quarterback and then everybody else is kind of like a role player. But on defense, I don't think that's the case. Um, and you really do have to have that, that, that solid foundation and that solid voice because, you know, you might be on the field, y'all are already gassed. You know, the opposing team's offense has been driving the ball down the, down the field all game. It's a, it's a critical third down. You need to get them off the field. It's third and five. They convert it's first down again. That, the, the, moral, the morale shift on defense, I can only imagine it's crazy. You know, it's crazy. If you're a cornerback and you, you're playing a receiver, obviously he's going to catch the ball a couple of times if you're targeting that receiver. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is the roller coaster ride on defense just seems like it's a lot worse than it would than it is on offense. And so you have to have that strong um, that leaders. You have, you, have, you have to have those strong leadership players on the team to not only necessarily voice their opinions, but to just be there as a presence, you know, you don't even have to make a play or really say anything to, to let it be known that, Hey, I'm still here. So yes, you're my teammate and you messed up, but we're going to get them on the next play. I just feel like that's so much more important on defense than it is offense. I could be wrong, but that's how I feel. Yeah. Marvin, how big was their return? You, you saw them. I think it was uh, very, very big because again, being a former middle linebacker myself, I, I <laughs> there's a lot of technical aspect that goes into it because again, no matter who you're looking at on the other side of that ball, that middle linebacker has to make all of the checks, all of the adjustments based upon what he sees. If you got motion, you got trips, you got quad receiver, you got 21 personnel, 12 personnel, and it's always going to change. That quarterback is always going to do something different. So, you know, he's always going to be somebody that's going to go in motion. He might come back. You just never know what you're going to get. So it's always great to have an experienced middle linebacker who knows exactly what he's looking at. He knows what plays come off each set because each set is going to – you can look at the set and tell what they're going to do. I mean, you got to know who's covered up, who's not covered up. These are all things that a veteran linebacker will know, and he'll be able to tell that to the other guys on defense, which in turn gives them a heads up. Also, you got to look at setting that defensive line. A veteran linebacker is going to know how to set that defensive line to the strength of that offense, whether it's to the tight end side, the multiple receiver side, away, depending upon the front, whether it's a bare front, any odd front. I mean, it's just so much that goes into it that most people don't even think about. So having a guy in there who's been there and knows how to do it and do it well, it makes a major difference in your entire game plan. Because if you're not comfortable with him as a defensive coordinator, it's hard for you to send certain checks and calls because you're not comfortable if they're going to make them. Because usually a call is a loaded call, meaning you got a defense's call, but usually there's one or two other defenses in the call with it based upon what you see that you'll have to adjust to. And you got like less than a second to make the decision mm -hmm. which one to adjust to. You bring up a very good point. Uh, that defensive line looked like a completely different defensive line for that very very reason that you mentioned right there. The line was set. People weren't in disarray. They weren't missing their gaps. They, they knew it was exactly what their assignment was, and they went straight to it. And, yeah, having uh, Dylan Moses, and that completely changed everything. Because last year, no Dylan Moses, man, complete chaos up front. This year – not chaos, and, man, we're getting a lot of penetration. Love to see that. Sticking with linebackers, uh, Glenn, you didn't get to watch the game, but, man, you missed a treat. We got a freshman linebacker, Will Anderson. That dude was an absolute beast. If he wasn't getting to a player, he was blowing the man up in front of him and made him regret that he lined up against <laughs> yeah. him. Yeah. This dude, this is a this is an 18-year-old playing like a grown man. So, Marvin, I mean – you heard what I'm saying. I'm passionate about him already. What did you think about the freshman? I think he did an amazing job. You know, he, I mean, coming off, coming off the end, he was physical. That was the most important thing, physical, physical, physical. And he always appeared to be where he was supposed to be because that's one of the things you worry about with younger guys. You know, are they going to read and react appropriately? Are you going to be where you're supposed to be? Because, again, when you're playing defense, it's all about – gap control being where you're supposed to be because all it takes is one man being out of place to have a big play broke on you. And he always seemed to be where he was supposed to be. And again, like one of my old coaches used to tell me, tell me, you know, when, when you get there, let him know you're there. He let them know. He was oh. extremely physical. That was the most important part because after last year, I thought we were soft as wet toilet tissue at times. You know, mm. I'm sorry. No, don't, <laughs> don't apologize for that. Extremely 
physical and out, man. I was so I enjoyed watching him play. So what you're saying is if he wanted to wear number 45, you would give him permission. Hey, have it. Put it on. Make me cry. <laughs> Make me cry. Uh, I know you didn't watch watch the game, Glenn, but you uh you played with uh Frey Roach your first year there. Now is the defensive line coach. Uh, how much of an impact do you feel like he makes out there? And, of course, Marvin, answer after him because you saw the game. And I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on Freddie. Um, Freddie, Freddie is a – for one, Freddie is a character, right? Um, he has a very creative mind. So I think that's important, especially when you're dealing with today's kid, to be able to engage with them and not necessarily on their level – but uh, but I know that Freddie is probably very good at getting the most out of them and igniting a fire in them. And um, so his 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 contribution to the team is not just X's and O's, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, he's probably had a lot of conversations with those players off the field about off the field subjects and, and, and matters of such. And so his contribution and, and his influence on the defense and the defensive line probably goes beyond football, which obviously will help them on the field. Uh, so I think he's a great addition. Marvin, what you are your know, thoughts on having Freddie Roach there? You know, me personally, I love having Freddie back, you know, because I'll be honest, I'm happy to see, you know, Freddie doing the extremely amazing job that he's doing. Because for the longest, all I thought Freddie wanted to do was ride around on his golf cart and act like he could play golf, you know. I was like, hey, man, <laughs> just because you drive. Hey, Mar we, we we lost you there, Marvin. You there? Technology is annoying. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we are. Yeah, I, I, you look like you had a great point. So please repeat what you said. <laughs> oh, about Freddie and, and his. Golf yes, club? please. Oh, yeah. I, I, for the long as I thought all Freddie wanted to do was ride around on that golf cart and tear up people's golf courses. You know, I'm like, Come on, <laughs> just because you go on a golf cart and golf clubs, that does not make you a pro, Freddie. Okay? You know, yeah. football should be the thing you're focused on. All right. You're not going to be the next Tiger Woods. So, but <laughs> I, I'm happy to have Freddie there. You know, he, he's doing an amazing job. And again, I, I don't see how you can't be motivated playing for a guy like Freddie because, you know, yeah. he's always going to get the yeah. best out of his guys. He's very energetic. You know, he's always going to bring it. He's not a laid back person. So, you know, I'm sure he's always excited. He's always on 100. So, you know, again, I, how can you not expect him to be successful? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I'm going to ask one of the typical media questions, a way too early assessment. Do you feel like based on the defensive performance, that we're starting to kind of maybe get back to the Alabama standard? You're asking me this? Yes, I'm asking you this. I know you're going to bring up what happened at the end, so this just <laughs> – Because, again, the old standard, we finished the games, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because I'm just saying from a defense – a former defensive player's perspective, defenses pride themselves on shutouts, Okay. You're giving up points. That takes away from that. You know, you know, I led one of the best defenses in the country, you know, and, and as a leader of one of the best in the country, you know, we prided ourselves on holding our opponents to, you know, under seven points a game. You know, if you can hold your opponent to seven points or less a game, you have a chance to win every game you step on that field of play. So for me, having them score those give me points at the end, you know. So I feel like we made progress, but we just got to finish. I got you. I agree with you completely. So, uh, that being said, uh, based on what you saw, the little bit you saw, Glenn and Marvin, who would you say your offensive and defensive players of the game were? I'll we'll start with you, Glenn, based on the highlights I guess you saw. Yeah, uh, I saw it was mostly offense, so I'll just speak on the offense. Um, hmm. I don't, I don't know. Probably I'd have to give it to, to Najee because you already know what, what, what 
what we got and um and Waddle. So the one the one knock I had on Najee was that um he wouldn't he wouldn't finish all of his runs. You know, mm-hmm. and from what I saw in those highlights, he was he he had some nice body lean going, you know, and if he get if he if he can if he can master that, because it's very it's very easy as a running back to to when you see contact to give them uh knees and elbows, you know, to 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 bring the contact to them, to attack them before they attack you. It's just a mind thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if he gets that down, then then he's gonna be very hard to to handle this year. So I saw a lot of that in the game, um, so I would give it to him. Good choice. I, I agree with you. He definitely has finished in plays. Uh, he didn't do that so much in the first part of his career and maybe a little bit uh, last season, but it's like something clicked inside of him, and all of a sudden he started becoming a more physical, more powerful, more driven Najee, and he definitely is uh, running through plays and just making sure – the whistle's blown before he stops uh, pushing those legs. So, yeah, good point. You know what motivated him? Yeah, look at that that Christian McCaffrey contract. Look at that. And no, I'm, no. <laughs> motivated. I'm tempted to put that helmet back on. <laughs> Run a few rocks myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, Marvin, who was your uh, who were your offensive and uh, defensive MVPs of that game? Offensive MVP, I got to give it to Jalen, the human highlight reel. And the reason why I'm going to give it to Jalen, there was one catch in particular that he went up and made, and he knew he was going to take the hit. He knew he was going to get hit. Mm. But yet he still held on to that ball regardless of that. And then just, you know, again, he's a highlight reel, man. Anytime you throw that guy out of the ball, you just sit back and, you know, wait, see what he's going to do with it because it's usually something very spectacular. And, again, I mean, how could you not give it to the guy? Yeah. You know, right. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, yeah. you know, second down and whatever, third down and whatever, he's the guy I'm looking for. I'm, there's a lot of weapons on that team, but Jalen will be the first guy that I'm looking for in any situation, man. I mean, he's going to bring it every time you give him the ball. And the thing that I like the most about him is his energy level. It seems like his energy. Marvin, are you still with us? How's that, how, how's that Xfinity treating you over there? <laughs> <laughs> still with us, Marvin? Yeah, I'm here. All uh, right, Xfinity uh, kind of interrupted your thunder there. So what were oh, you man. saying about Jalen? Well, well, you could let me in on my other device. I tried to get you to let me in on that one the first time. I did. I clicked on it, and you weren't there. So <laughs> I'm here you in front of me. So, you know, <laughs> Go to that one. Feel free. Um, but, yeah, um, like I said, his energy level is always on 1,000. I mean, anytime you see that guy, he's always pumped. He's yeah. always got – He's uh, you know, he – again, he's uh, he does that move. You know when he goes mm-hmm. – Yeah. You know, <laughs> highlight. Right, because he's uh, – yeah, that <laughs> – you're right, man. I don't think he has a down moment. Even in, in press conferences, man, he, he's just exploding with energy at the podium. It's crazy. But right. you want that in a player. You definitely – especially in, in, in a leader like he is. Uh, so, yeah. what grade would y'all give the, the performance this past Saturday? Um, I can't. I feel like I can't give a grade. Um, I, I can't give one because I didn't watch the game. I'm That's going fair, to go Marvin. B minus. Man, and I know why. I think we've already discussed it, so I completely get where you're coming from. Well, <laughs> we didn't play the second half. It looked like two different teams. Pump the, the brakes. And the second half team. It was two completely different teams. Yeah. And that's the very first thing that Coach Saban mentioned in that interview. Didn't talk about anything else. Very first thing he said, you know, we, we lost intensity. So, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, great, great job talking about that game. All right, Glenn, it's time for us to focus on you. You're our guest. We brought yeah. you here because you had a phenomenal career at Alabama. I definitely enjoyed you. Uh, you're definitely one of my favorite running backs of all time. I was excited when Marvin told me that he was bringing you on. So, let's shift the focus now to you. <laughs> so, uh, of course, it's another – Hey, man, glad to do it. Of course, we're in week two of the SEC. 
Uh, Glenn, can you kind of go through what your daily routine was uh, leading up to an SEC game? Uh, what your, I guess, uh, uh, tendencies were, what was on your playlist, uh, you know, what you would eat, you know, things like that? Um, to be honest, uh, I played most of my um, athletic career uh, in college, I should say, kind of like scared. Um, when I, as I look back, I never felt like I had the confidence that I should have had. Uh, more, more than looking to make the play, I was scared that I would mess up the play. Um, and so, so in that aspect, uh, I wish I would have. I, I wish I would have had more fun. You know, we used to hear that from the coaches yeah. all the time: just go out there and have fun, have fun, have fun. But I was never able to. Um, and so, you know, I left a year early. Uh, I still had a year left at Bama. I left early. One of the reasons I left early is because I didn't want to play football anymore. Um, I grew up very indifferent about everything in my life because of uh, some circumstances from how I was raised. And um, so football for me was kind of like, uh, you know, people say like sports is an outlet. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, just calling it an outlet would, would, would make it too, uh, it was simplified too much. For me, it was kind of like an escape almost, and it kind of kept me out of my thoughts. So I guess in a way you could call it an outlet for me. Uh, so when you talk about a daily routine and like stuff like that, I really didn't have one. Um, I'm, not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating when I say this, that we were playing Arkansas uh, the upcoming Saturday. I wouldn't know who we had the Saturday after. Uh, I, I kind of felt like I was just there, to be honest. Um, so I didn't really have a routine. As far as a playlist, it could be a whole gambit of music. So it was never it was never one thing. It always changed game to game. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I, I know that probably doesn't answer your question, but I never I never fit the mold. I never fit the mold of a jock, if that makes sense. No, it definitely answers my question. And to be honest with you, I'm a bit shocked because watching the way you ran, you ran like you had it all together and then you were out there to punish <laughs> any defender that stepped in your way and you were there to be uh, a playmaker. So you definitely had us fooled. I'll say that right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody would have known that you yeah. were at all about anything. I mean, yeah. well, but, that I get what you're saying because again, that's 90, 100,000 people. A lot of people don't understand that pressure, man, because you got your yeah. family and friends watching on TV, commentary. Hey, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Glenn, what player or players on either side of the ball help prepare you the best for uh, each, each game? Um, early in my early in my first two couple years there, it was a, definitely KD, Ken of Darby. Yeah. Um, he's he's got to be the coolest cat on the planet. Uh, and and his cool was not. I'm 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 trying to show you I'm cool. Hey, look at me. His was just like from the core. And so early on in my career, he was definitely like a brother for me. Um, and then later on, uh, I didn't I didn't really have that. I was I was kind of a I was kind of a uh, I would always call myself a loner. Um, I'm trying to think to who I looked up to back then. Really, probably one of my best friends, uh, Roy Upchurch. Mm. You know, um, whenever either one of us would have a down day or a down game, we were always the first one we would come come look for and, and talk to about. And so having him, was def uh, he was definitely a shoulder for me to lean on when I was at Bay. Yeah. Where is Roy at now? I have not seen him. That's <laughs> yeah, that good I man. That, that's a that's a question I've been wanting to answer to for a while. Uh, I can't I can't just like throw his business out there. You know what I'm saying? He's a very personal person, so uh, he's he's doing good things. He's um he's still he's still looking to uh to advance in a coaching career. Oh. Um. So he definitely has a passion for coaching. He has a passion for for the kids, and a lot of his, a lot of what, a lot of what he does has to do with football, but it has to do with life as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, I, I just I don't want to throw his business out there, but he's doing good though. He's doing good. He's a family man and all that stuff. So hey, well, well, do me a favor. You don't have to tell him I am looking for him. I got you. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell him, man, tell him I want to catch up with him, man. You know, because I okay. was down there with those guys in that '09 season. You know, helping helping out with the team and doing. Oh, okay, okay. Things. So you know, I got to spend a lot of. Dang, I hate that he keeps breaking up. When he's trying to <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if he's trying to take a dramatic pause or uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to add effect, but yeah, you know, I definitely enjoyed Up Church, and I definitely like the way. He, oh, there he is! He's, he's coming back. Who me? Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, you, you, you're... <laughs> Xfinity won't let me be great again. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> So from now on, I'm just going to use my phone on these. I'm not even going to attempt using my computer anymore. It's a waste of time. <laughs> but um, to your point, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying because yeah. I didn't prepare for games like I should have. Right, right, right. I, I mean, very rarely did I watch film. And most of the time when I watched film, it was during, you know, individual meetings and I would act like I was paying attention. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Man, I always thought you were a student in the game, Marvin. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think he paused again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about your beginning at Alabama. Uh, can you talk about your transition to the college game, you know, hurdles you faced, and yeah. then when you felt like you really hit your stride? Uh, man, it was hard at first um, because I was coming in with Roy, who was like a top three runner back in Florida. Uh, I was coming in with Mike Ford, who he didn't make it, but he was another, I think, number one running back in Florida. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I was really expected to be the number two guy behind behind Kenneth, but I knew that as a running back, if you couldn't pass pre- pass protect, then you wouldn't be on the field. And so I made that my focus as a freshman, and that's why I ended up being number two. It wasn't because of potential or ability. It was just because I understood the defense. I understood the linebackers and the, and the fronts and stuff like that. And I was able to pass block. Uh, but in my opinion, my freshman year was horrible. You know, um, I didn't take advantage of the season like I wanted to. I had all these aspirations to be freshman All-American, freshman all the SEC, all that stuff, all that jazz. But it never happened. Going into my sophomore year, I got hurt in spring, missed that whole season. Um, and at that point, I was depressed. Uh, I wanted to quit football. That was when I re- really wanted to quit. Um, and what helped me through it was uh, one day I was walking around on crutches. And the FCA director at the time, Coach Kramer, would always be like, Glenn, are you going to come to the FCA? And I'd always be like, yeah, 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 but I would never go. And so one day I, I, poked, I happened to be uh, crutching around and I poked my head in the window of the uh, classroom they were meeting and I saw like 40 girls and I was like dang I can, I can check out FCA I can go to FCA <laughs> so I went to FCA um that was the first time that uh that I that I fell in love with with, with Christ and yeah. they calmed me down and because it calmed me down I was able to say okay you know it's a blessing that I'm at Alabama it's a blessing that I'm getting free education and uh, even though I think college is overrated and uh you know, it's a blessing that I'm here. So let me buckle down and do what I got to do. So going into my red shirt sophomore year, I was battling with uh, Terry Grant, um, Jimmy Johns, you know, who was linebacker, yeah. quarterback, running back. Everything, yeah. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> and midway through that season, I found myself third string on the depth chart. And I thought to myself, like, how is this happening? You know, uh, I put all my eggs in this one basket which is make it to the NFL. And now I'm year three into my college career and I'm third string. Like, I don't understand. But as I said, because of my faith, I was fine with it. Um, fast forward, uh, I finished the season starting, but still an unknown running back. You know, I'm a starting running back for Alabama, but I'm still unknown. Going into that next year, I told myself I was going to do a couple of things. My last year at Alabama, I said, one, I was going to become a star or at least have notoriety so that when the media interviewed me, I could talk about Jesus. Yeah. Two, there was this freshman named Mark Ingram who I was not going to let take my spot. Right? <laughs> There's no right. way a freshman was going to take my spot. And, and three, 
I just was fed up because I knew that I wasn't giving it my all. So you say like, I know y'all said like, it didn't seem like I didn't, I lacked confidence, but I told myself that if I could become the toughest player on the field, then I had to add something to my game. And so the, the way I ran and how I finished runs and, and, and how I competed was me simply saying, if I add toughness to my game, because you can't just add speed overnight. Right. You can't add strength. You can't add this, that, or the third. But what you can do is you can change your mental and say, I'm going to I'm gonna approach this in a way I've never approached it before. And so that's where that, uh, that's where that bell came about as far as people thinking like, oh, he plays with a lot of confidence when I didn't. I just played with a, with a, 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 a mentality that said, if you're going to tackle me, I'm going to make you pay. And that, and that was easy for me, you know, so. Right. Um, and one of the things that I've known about you is, um, is, is your relationship with Christ because it's always been at the forefront. It's, uh, it's always been something that's widely known. And uh, when I was at Alabama, I, even though I didn't play, I uh, knew Sean Alexander very well. And he's one of the people that really helped me acclimate to a big school because I came from a very small area in Mississippi. Right. But he brought, he brought me to FCA. And even though I was on the team, he invested in me as a person and because – he felt like he would, his his platform was football, so he could glorify God, glorify right. Christ, and he was a, a spiritual mentor for me, and I'm sure for the rest of the team. I'm sure Marvin could attest to that. Who was it spiritually that helped you on that team? Who really invested you and helped your growth of Christ? Uh it really wasn't. Just to be honest, it wasn't. It wasn't anybody else. It was. It was. I was chasing girls, and and and, and he found me. To to yeah. You know. He's an honest oh, man. Well. <laughs> that's, really, <laughs> that's really how it happened. Like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I, I'm not mad at you, man. Hey, I'll that's admit, you, uh, every year in FCA, the, the girls who were there got more beautiful each year. So I have no doubt when you were there, the, the tradition continued. So <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, playing at the University of Alabama, it does have special meaning, especially playing the running back, because names like Bobby Humphrey, Saran Stacy, Sherman Williams, Sean Alexander, like we just talked about, were a few of the greats before you. What did it mean to you being in the next man up on that list of greats? Um, you know, it's 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 a funny conversation because I only I only had one great, or I ain't gonna say great, I only had one good season. A lot of those guys you mentioned they produce their whole careers at Alabama. And it, it makes me laugh because people really do throw me in the conversation, maybe not necessarily of all time greats at Alabama, but at least in the saving era. And it kind of makes me feel funny because we've had some good running backs come through there, you know? Uh, hey, man. But I do, hey, Glenn. Go ahead. Don't shortchange yourself, <laughs> man. Come, thank you. Claim. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Because I'm gonna yeah. be honest with you. When people start talking about the all-time greats at Alabama at linebacker, hey, I'm gonna throw my hat right in there with them. So, yeah. Hey, <laughs> boom. Absolutely. You better speak on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, but no, I do. I do find a sense of pride in it, and uh, a lot of people do tell me like that. Uh, they really, they really, they really hold me in high regard as far as Alabama running backs, and I and I do. I'll take that to my grave. I won't, I won't, I won't downplay that. I'll take that to my grave as a sense of pride for me in my life. And I look back at it sometimes because there were so many times that I didn't even think I was going to even really start at Alabama. So for people to say I was one of the one of the the the, the, the top running backs to come through there, like it's almost like somebody handed me a free cake or something. I don't know. That's that's kind of how I feel about it. Like, I'll, I'll take it like uh, I definitely appreciate you being humble but I will say this I mean whether you feel like you did it or not you really were the jump start of the great stable of running backs this that Saban the Saban era really started you were the starting point uh and I, I'll definitely uh, fight on that hill for as long as I live there's no question about that yeah uh, approaching that 2008 season, of course, not many people were expecting much out of us. Uh, as the first game against Clemson drew closer, no one was really giving us a chance. Of course, we ended up shocking the world. We demolished those Tigers 34 to 10. And I remember in the post game, Kirk Herstreet could not find words to explain what he just saw. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you guide us through what happened during the off season that led to that big victory? So that's the whole, I wish I might write a book on that. Um, because, you know, you watch movies, you watch sports movies and they try to like, they try to glamorize it and they try to make you all inspired and they try to bring out and evoke, they try to invoke all these emotions in you. And I thought it was only like movie stuff. But then I realized after that first year of us going seven and six and seeing and feeling the energy that Saban brought, I, I, began to, I began to realize like, wow, this is like a real thing. Like you really can take one person and uh, affect hundreds of other people. You know, whether it's a team or, or I imagine great generals of the past have done the same thing. But what he was able to do, you can't really put into words. And you can have somebody say all the same things that Coach Saban said during that offseason, and it wouldn't be the same, not even close. So that's a testament to, like, who he is as a man and as a person. But going into that Clemson game, imagine this, imagine this. We go seven and six, right? Mm-hmm. Before that season, Coach Saban said all the things he said after that season, as far as uh, as far as dominate your box, you know, um, uh, all the things he said. Like, I can't think of it right now, but you know, all the famous Saban quotes. We believed everything he said before that seven to six season, and we believe everything he said after that seven to six season. Um, and so I don't know how how better else to say this, but anything he said. We didn't just believe it because he said it. We could tell that he, we could tell that he believed what was coming out of his mouth. I guess is it. I can. I'll, I'll start rambling if I try to explain that feeling that he was able to bring to the team. Hey, you can you can ramble as long as you like, buddy. We we can we can stay as long as you want. I'm okay with that. Oh, <laughs> uh, and it right, seemed right, like. Right. Go ahead. So before that Clemson game, we already knew we won. And I know that sounds cliche, and I know people say that all the time, but like we were not surprised when we when we, when we left that game with the easy win. Not easy, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it was easy. Just say <laughs> it. <laughs> it was. Hey, listen, they they were I not. I don't specialize in modesty, so you talking to the wrong. <laughs> 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 I don't think they were ready for that 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 type of physicality you guys brought yeah. at all. They never saw anything like that in the ACC. Right, right. No, not like that. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. And it's funny. It's like every time like, – I feel like the media had these uh, designated prove-it games for Alabama that year. It's like they didn't want to go ahead and crown us as back. And right. every time every time we got – to the to the prove it game like the the famous blackout game where we obliterated Georgia, you had an amazing game of course, and then they're like oh well, they hadn't done anything until they go down the Baton Rouge okay no difference in Baton Rouge whatsoever we yeah. won that game twenty seven twenty one in overtime we got the first SEC West title since Marvin was was pl- that playing uh, usually a team that wasn't used to that type of success kind of folds under pressure what was different about you guys. We all believed in each other. Um, I don't know. It's just hard to put into words. We just, we weren't afraid to lose. It's kind of like, you know, you can fight some guys who have, you know, let's say in, in street fights, a guy has won 10, but he's lost 15, but you respect him as if he won all of his fights. Mm-hmm. That was kind of how we felt about going into games. Like we weren't worried about, necessarily winning the game. I know that sounds funny, but we weren't nec- worried about necessarily scoring as many points as we can or the defense holding them to a shutout. It was always about punching that person in the mouth. It was always about it was always about getting hit in the mouth and then punching that person back in the mouth. Like that was our mentality. So regardless of where we were in the game, we could be down, we could be up. It didn't matter because we was gonna come with it and you was gonna handle us and you was gonna have to you was gonna have to deal with us regardless of what you was doing. That was that was how we handled that stuff. So. It feels like I'm watching a Rocky movie, man. This is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah, just real, like I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. Stuff, <laughs> and one of the things that uh, we've talked about each week, and Marvin, you can attest to this, uh, and we don't even have to bring this part up. Is you know, paying it forward. Every generation at every position pays it forward. You know. Uh, 
Ken Darby had Shaw Williams who paid it forward to him. Then Ken Darby, you know, paid it forward to you. And you already mentioned this early earlier, you know, for you, it was Mark Ingram. And you describe your relationship with Mark at that time and then what you taught him. Um, it was always it was always everybody come to the table and eat. You know, if he had a question, I answered it. And I honestly found myself watching him a lot because you knew Mark was special the moment he touched down at Bama. And it was the first time in my life that I had experienced that. Just seeing a, a guy in practice with no pads on and me saying, whoa, like, he's going to be special. That's that's what Mark brought to the table. Uh, so our relationship, it, was, it wasn't a fake one. We were always competing against each other, but we always kept it respectable, you know. And uh, I will never forget that. I will never forget that because what what is it called? Like uh, – what is it called when you push on um, uh, competition, but like some competition? Anyways, you know, healthy competition. Right, right. That's all it was was healthy competition, and and for me, it was a lot of it was a lot of selfishness involved because I just didn't want a freshman taking my spot. Like just <laughs> point blank, period. I did not want a freshman taking my spot. So, yeah. And it didn't really seem like a competition at all. It really seemed like a band of brothers, to be honest with you. You, Mark, and then Roy, um, all all together working as one unit. And a unit, of course, nobody could really stop either. <laughs> but nobody will deny, you know, that season was coffee season. I, I got to give props where, where it's due, man. You showed out. I mean, big games against Georgia, blackout game. Uh, you roasted the hogs. I mean, that was a thing of beauty what you did against Kentucky. Uh, but to me, the best of all, you saved the best for last, and that was in the Iron Bowl. Yeah. And that was the first Iron Bowl we, when we've had in six or seven years. Years. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about that game and just how big that was for you? Uh, that, was, that was a pinnacle of – all the blood, sweat, and tears that I put into playing football since I was a since I was a kid. Um, that's not, I mean that's my favorite run of my life of my lifetime is when I ran for that forty something down the down the sideline. Like, yeah, that was that was definitely the pinnacle. That was that was the that was the summit of I'm 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 lifting all these weights. I'm having to go to summer workouts in high school, you know, as a senior, when I want to go play on the beach, you know, I'm, I'm from Fort Wallen. So like in the summer you're, you're at the beach, mm -hmm. you know, but I couldn't, so I don't know that that game was, uh, when I look back on that game, sometimes I, I, I sit back and just say like, wow, that, that was a cool feeling, you know, cause, cause we, yeah, we, we brutalized them boys that game. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, Marvin, what was your takeaway watching Glenn in that phenomenal season? The biggest thing for me was actually watching the team turn it around from what we'd been those previous years because, you know, everybody who knows me knows I talk more trash than probably anybody you know. When I say I don't specialize in modesty, I mean that. I'm that guy. I, I mean, even when I played, I was the one who was always going to talk crap to you while I was handing you your butt. Mm. So for me, <laughs> it was like everybody who I've been talking crap to all those years were now talking crap to me. So I just want to take <laughs> to get him off my back and return oh, yeah. to glory so that I can resume business as usual. Yeah. For <laughs> but, sure, for sure. but that was a great season, man. And uh, you know, watching, you know, y'all do what you did. You know, and I was actually living in Dallas at the time. So me and Tony Dixon used to watch all the games together, you know. Uh, man, so even in Dallas, you know, I talked crap in Big 12 country. I, I loved every moment of it, you know. And then, you know, going on to win the SEC and watching Tebow cry on his knee. Oh, man, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm thankful for every moment y'all provided us that season. You know, you all did phenomenal work. You know, a great job. Yeah. Champion. Out. because again the year before you lose to you uh, louisiana monroe i mean that when you lose a team like that it, it can serve as it can go two ways one it can make the season go in the toilet or two you guys are going to come together you're going to rally and you're going to figure it out you guys rallied you figured it out next right. year champions 
you know, you couldn't have done it any better, man. You know, my hat goes off to you guys. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate it. I don't know about the trash talking, Marvin. I mean, you know, Jawan Simpson, who Glenn knows, uh, claims um, he's, the great, he's the greatest trash talker of all time. Uh, but but there's, there's one other guy that we're going to have on the show that – probably can be the proclaimed greatest trash talker of all time and that's antonio langham so i mean between those two guys man where do you feel you stand <laughs> i'm probably number one because see the difference <laughs> i was laughing and talking trash the whole time i talk trash to my teammates in practice i talk trash in games i talk trash to everybody i didn't care what the situation was <laughs> We know that's right. <laughs> well, Glenn, of course, we, we got very close to when getting to the natty that year. What's the one thing you felt that we needed that could have gotten us back to that stage in 2008? Uh, are you, are you, are you Go ahead. Uh, or can you really narrow it down to one particular thing? Because I felt like we had the team in place to do it. They start running the ball in the SEC championship game uh, in the fourth quarter. I, I go, I, I'll say that forever. Like I don't know why, but we stopped running the ball in the fourth quarter, and I mm -hmm. don't understand it. I to this day it blows my mind. Like why we start running the ball? I don't know. I mean, you bring up a very good point. I mean, because uh, up until then, I mean, y'all, they couldn't stop it. They didn't have an answer for it. You were hitting them in the mouth. And that's one of the things that you, you talked about earlier was hitting folks in the mouth and just, yeah. just knocking them silly. And, and you were doing that. So why, you know, break away from that formula? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, that and, and that game, uh, I, hate, I hate saying this. I became a, a Tebow fan as far as as far as him as a as a football player and an athlete. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll just leave it. At that. <laughs> yeah, I I don't blame you there. I think we all were if we, if if we had, were pressed to admit it. <laughs> yeah. But then as a person though too, man, I mean, I mean, just a godly man and somebody that you, you can't say anything negative about for sure. Well, we can uh, talk about 2009, him on that sideline crying. So. Oh, yeah. we can do that. I mean, we can also play, we can also play the video. I mean, if you <laughs> – Right. Oh, forever etched in our memories for sure. Um, well, Lynn, I know it's probably hard for you to narrow this down, but what would you say your best game was wearing that crimson uniform? Uh, best game – I have I have to give it to that Clemson game because that that set the tone for everything. Not just for me, but for for the whole team. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say the Clemson game because I, I went into that game not knowing if I was going to be the starting running back to, to by the end of the season. You know, and and I hate to put it on me and 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 and, and me being a starter, but I, I went into that game like kind of selfless in a way because I didn't, I didn't care if I, I hate, I have to admit a part of me was like, Mark might take your spot. You feel like legitimately. Yeah. He was that good as a freshman. Right. And, and so not only was it in my head, not only was I like, we got to set the tone for the season, but I knew that I had to set the tone for myself as far as the starting running back in Alabama. And so I'd have to say that's, that's my most precious game. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, uh, Marvin had nothing to worry about anybody unseating him. Matter of fact, we brought this up in the uh, our episode last week. He actually sent a player to another school <laughs> because he took his the spot. Guy, the guy who was supposed to be mentoring me, he realized very quickly that, yeah, I don't want to compete with that guy. And he just transferred. I was like, right, come on, man. And we, never to be heard from again. That's <laughs> And he was all SEC the previous year, and Yay. all of a sudden, post. <laughs> Marvin and did something know, to him, man. You know how much trouble I got in behind that situation? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did did, they, did they, really try to, they really try to put the blame on you? No, 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 no. So after it happens, right, reporters asking me about it in the press conference. <laughs> how do you feel about it? And my response, you know, they, they rated like the most famous quotes in Alabama football history. My quote to this day is the number three rated quote in Alabama football history. So I I'm in front of all these reporters. 
and they asked me this question. This was my answer. Oh, I don't care that he transferred. I was planning on starting anyway, so it's probably best that he left. Oh, no, God. Whoa. <laughs> oh, we got it. You was a lion when you said you got a hey, look. Yeah. yeah. Next day, I'm in coach's office. He's just holding up the paper, <laughs> like, really? Like, this is what you're going to say to the reporters? Like, this is what you're just going to fire off? I was like, well, I mean, it was true. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to terrorize people. <laughs> But you know, I know I could have went about that completely different. But yeah. oh, no, no, you wouldn't have. But you wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get yeah. that sound bite, please? <laughs> yeah, I, said, I didn't care that. I was planning on starting anyway. So, <laughs> so, so was this before or after you embarrassed uh, Chris Samuels? This was after I had already uh, knocked Chris on his ass. I mean, that was a whole different situation. <laughs> Lynn, did you hear that story? No, I haven't. Uh... <laughs> Marvin, I, I would love to hear it again. I never get tired, even though I made a video of it from last week's podcast and put it on the internet. Uh, please tell that awesome story again. Well, yeah, I never backed down from anybody. And <laughs> even as a freshman, I felt like everybody was not on the same level that I played on. So I was never scared of anybody. So one day we in practice, you know, call a blitz and I run the blitz and it's against Chris Samuels, you know, Outland Trophy winner. Oh God, when I hit Chris, Chris turned half a flip and landed flat on his ass. <laughs> he he jumped up and he was so mad. Oh, hell no. <laughs> he, he at Coach Callaway telling him to repeat it. I'm over there dying laughing, right? Because I told you, after I would hit people, I would be able to kill him myself laughing, talking crap to him. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might have made him more mad than anything, the fact that I was over there laughing about it. <laughs> and this is a guy who uh, went to eight uh, Pro Bowls out of ten, the 10 years he was in the league, all pro, about to put on that jacket. <laughs> yeah. Man, but, you know, very the, the special thing story. About it, though, man, you you could ask anybody who I played with. Though I, I just approached the game completely differently, you know, and I terrorized my teammates in practice just like I did in games. You know, I, I didn't take yeah. plays off. So, man, that was hobby. That was hobby arenas every practice. Oh, <laughs> I hate that. I used to hate it. Hey, <laughs> why would you hate having somebody on your team? Exactly. Who's okay. Okay. Because look. Because look. You already got your plans for what you're going to do later that night. You already upset that you got to go to practice after you did school work all day long. Like, it's just another added thing on my bucket list that I had to deal with every day. I did, oh, it was annoying. It was annoying. Hey, and really? I do. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I used to enjoy knowing that if I didn't want you to run a play, you weren't going to run that play. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I used to enjoy that. <laughs> Like, I don't care what you think you're about to run. I'm going to show you differently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the coaches would be so mad. Like, run it again. Somebody block uh, him. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Uh, staying with that same thing, you know, I got to turn it to you, Glenn. Can you name a favorite moment where you trucked, stiff-armed, or faked out a well-known player right out of his cleats? Mm, people were hyping up. Um I didn't truck him or, or or embarrass him or nothing like that. But people were hyping up. Uh, what's his name? He was a middle linebacker from Florida when we played him in the SEC championship game. Oh, uh, Spikes? Spikes. They were hyping him up so much. And that game, he got his hands on me a couple of times. And I won that battle every time. Uh, and I'll, I'll never forget that because they were making him out to be all world. And – I ain't gonna say I was a better player than him, but that game he, he could claim it. Claim it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He didn't want. He didn't want any issues that game, and so I, I, I think about that. It makes me chuckle sometimes. <laughs> I, I think he still has nightmares. To be honest with you, he wasn't. He wasn't the same after that. I will admit that because I watched the way he played in his body language. <laughs> Oh, um, I, before we go to predictions, let's kind of jump to your your time in the NFL. Of course, you came out, went to the San Francisco 49ers um, and had a chance to to play with Frank Gore uh, before we kind of talk about your career as a whole. 
tell us what it meant to uh, play with uh, Frank Gore, who, by the way, is still going. Yeah. Um, he's still going because he gives it his all, you know. Um, in the NFL, it's kind of a thing to, to let the rookie take the reps so that you can kind of chill and, you know, let your body continue to heal because you're getting older in age and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Frank would not take a play off, and it had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with this upcoming rookie trying to trying to take my spot and nothing like that. That's just how he approached the game. And I remember I went over to his place. The first time I went over to his place after practice, I can't remember if it was after a game or after practice. It was after practice. We get over there, and the first thing he does is he gets in the cold tub in his apartment, and then his masseuse comes over. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm looking at him like, all right, what are we about to do? And he just sits on the couch and then and he does nothing. And then I realized after knowing him and knowing some more of my getting to know more of my teammates, that was his whole routine throughout the whole season. <clears throat> One time after a game, we were out in San Fran and uh, we went out to the club. Frank stood in the same spot the whole night. You know what I'm saying? Like, so his approach to the game and, 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 and how he approached himself and his body it, it amazed me. And Frank is a, is a chubby kid, right? Like, I'm sure he was chubby when he was a kid. I'm sure he was chubby um, all throughout his life. So it was funny because when he would show up um, during the season, by the end of the season, he wouldn't have a six-pack. But the next season, he showed up six-pack. You know what I'm saying? So, like, in the offseason, he was down in Miami sweating the whole time. So that's why he's still playing to this day. And I just – it just – it amazed me because – I feel like everybody else in the NFL was just like, yeah, I'm in the NFL. But Frank approached it like he was out of high school, coming into college, uh, snotty nose, little kid, just trying to just trying, trying to make his way on the team. That's how he approached every practice, every rep. And so I, I'll never forget that. <clears throat> I, I wonder if he's uh, waiting for his son to join him in the league and then, and then he's going to go out. <laughs> <laughs> He's not too far off, to be honest with you. But, um, of course, uh, you had a chance to really play a lot in your rookie season, and it looked like it just came really easy for you. Of course, you know, you played Alabama and the SEC, who uh, Marvin will agree with, is the NFL-ready conference. Right. So uh, kind of talk to us about that that first season and how you were able just to transition so well. And uh, to me, I felt like you made a really good impact with that team. Uh you know, everybody talks about um, the speed difference in the NFL compared to college, but I don't think it was necessarily a speed difference. Um, I think it was more so in the NFL, the, uh, the defense just made, they made less uh, mistakes. You know, uh, Marvin talked about gap control earlier. In college, you might have, let's say, uh, 15 blown assignments in a, by a defense in a game, when in reality, I think it's a lot more than that. But uh, – in, the, in college, if it was 15 missed assignments, in the league, it was only three, mm-hmm. you know. And in college, you know, um, as a running back, I would get hit. And then in my head, I would expect another another hit for sure. You know, I would expect two points of contact as far as other grown men hit me. And then if I touched the ground, maybe I would get a third. In the NFL, you get about five or six, like legitimately, like, in yeah. the NFL, uh, 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 in college, a late hit is not a late hit in the league. At least it wasn't when I was playing. Uh, it, it might be. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's flag football now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Marvin, you would have been the most penalized player in the league if, that, if you were in there right now. Uh, yeah, fine. <laughs> All of the above. Oh, man. <laughs> but, but I think the physicality didn't change much, whereas I think in other conferences – if you go to the from those conferences to the NFL, the physicality might amp up a little bit. It didn't really amp up, in my opinion. I got, yeah, most definitely. Um, and, and let's talk about one of the biggest things. You know, before we move on to our next point, uh, uh, it's a high year career, but you know, it was really just starting to take off. Um, of course, a lot of us thought that you're going to be the next great back in the league. You right. decided, you know what? It's time for me to go, and you enlist in the military. Uh, one of the best stories to this day I've ever heard, and um, I, I love you know hearing about it and reading about it over and over again. But I want a chance to really hear from your perspective um, what led that to, to that decision, and and just what that meant 
meant to you? Man, I would I would need more time to really give you the full rundown, but I kind of touched on it before. In uh in middle school and even kind of before I was suicidal, right? Mm. So my yeah. whole life I've had kind of like this dark cloud, not hanging over me, but a dark cloud that I noticed. And the money brought it back to light. You know, like when they say more money, more problems, that's a real thing. All right. And, and for me, I've never been a guy who was materialistic. I never really got excited about parties or women or, or flashy things. So the NFL for me was just a den of evil, man, to be honest, you know? Oh. Um, and so it was, it was really one of the darker periods of my life because all I ever wanted to do was play in the NFL. All I ever wanted to be was a running back. A lot of that was other people's expectations, but a lot of it was me just playing football since I was, you know, since I was two years old. Yeah. And so when I left Bama early, I told myself, I don't want to play football anymore, but maybe if I get paid to play, I'll tolerate football. And I got to the league, I got my check, and it was the opposite. Um, and so my decision to leave was not me saying I'm going to quit the, the NFL to, be, to join the military. And my decision to leave was me just simply being in, in a depressed state. You know, I started to wake up with this thought in my head, and I've never been this person. I started to wake up with this thought, and this thought went like this. You young, you got money, and you handsome. And I couldn't admit this even on air. I don't care who's listening because, you know, God will use it, you know, for his glory. Yeah. Uh, I had thoughts of suicide. I know how real it is. I know how dark, you know, a, a place you can get into. Right. But because of Christ, you know, I was able to overcome that. Yeah. How did how did God uh, move in your life that helped you to finally uh, defeat depression and defeat uh, suicidal thoughts and tendencies? Um, for, for one, I, I appreciate you saying that, man. That, that's that's like some real, that's some, that's, that's real, bro. You know, I, I really appreciate you, 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 you sharing that. Um, overcoming it, I became okay with who I was outside of what everybody else thought. Um, you froze on my screen. Can you still hear me? Oh, I got, you just popped back in. I think a little bit of Marvin's Xfinity is, is, is filtered into your stream. <laughs> <laughs> But he lost me for like five seconds. All right. Yeah. Can you repeat what, what you okay. just said? I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, dang, what did I say? Um, oh, well, so I began to be, I, I began to be comfortable with who I was as a person. Um, I feel like for most of my life, I was trying to be somebody that other people saw me as. Uh, for instance, in high school, I really love what you would call like golf, golf chicks like girls that had purple in their hair and, and wore like the boots, like that was my thing. But I would never approach them because I was the jock, because I was the football star. I was only supposed to go after the cheerleaders or the cool girls in the school. I never, I never did things that I wanted to do. You know, it's certain music back when I was that age that I wouldn't listen to because my friends weren't listening to it because I had to portray this image. And looking back, I realized that that stereotype and how I saw myself portrayed in everybody else's eyes followed me into adulthood. And when I realized that, I was able to shake that and say, this is who I am and this is who I want to be. And so me quitting the NFL and, and, and me going through what I call everyday life and everyday struggles for, for most of America, um, I think it made me who I am today. Yeah. Shell again, guys. You there? Yeah, you just came back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I guess uh, <laughs> we get we getting a little Whatever bit of. Feel uh, like. Yeah. Keep, you, you there? Yeah, we're all here. Yeah, I said, don't ever feel like you're alone because again, depression is a real situation. You know, um, yeah. my first book was actually about athletes and dealing with depression. Because you, everybody sees the athlete and you're supposed to be the big strong guy the gladiator the warrior the rrr, no feelings no emotions and that's right. so far from the truth you know honestly i think athletes probably have more emotions than anybody else because of the roller coaster rides that you're on the highs right. the lows you know as an athlete you have to be in tune with your emotions because they change so often i mm -hmm. mean it, it's not i mean regular life you know you're going to get up you're going to go to work 
boom, that's it. As an athlete, you don't know if you're going to get hurt. You might be winning a game. You might lose a game. You might get traded. There's so many things that yeah. comes into it that people don't even consider that's going to affect your mind state on a daily basis. So mm-hmm. you know, don't, don't, don't ever feel like what you did was, was not the best decision for you. And again, for me personally, when I went through my depression, you know, the best thing I could have did was write that book. Once I wrote that book, I got it all out and that helped me out a lot. So right. don't ever be afraid to express yourself and tell people how you really feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel yeah. like we could actually have a, a podcast about this and, you know, maybe I would definitely look to explore that one day because, you know, one of the things I try to incorporate and uh, what we do here is having a great message or having a, uh, a good godly spiritual message because we're on a platform that reaches out to a lot of people. And you know, not just in the athletic arena, but just everywhere. And you never know who God puts in the audience that needs to hear that message at that moment. So, yeah, yeah we definitely love to revisit that. All right. All right. Let's move on to the next part of our program, and that's predictions. Uh, so let's go around the room and talk about uh, week two for the SEC. And I think week five for everybody else. Uh, since you are a guest, Glenn, I'll start with you, and then Marvin, I'll get your take, and then I'll uh, be the last one. I guess I'm the Kirk Herbstreit of the bunch. <laughs> All right, uh, number three, Florida, after a big, big win, our offensive showcase against Ole Miss. They're taking on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Who you got, Glenn? Uh, I got to say South Carolina because my brother went to school there, so I'm going right. to say South Carolina. But I, otherwise, I don't know. Uh, I got you. All right, Marvin, who you got? I like, I like Florida by 10. I wonder why you like Florida in that game. Jeremiah Moon, man. I got to support my, 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 my best friend, his, his nephew. I got to support him, man. It's not because, it's not, it's not because you, you were a closet Gator fan for a lot of your life. <laughs> Cause, cause I did used to like the Florida Gators growing up. But that's not the reason why. Darius Gill was <laughs> Jeremiah Moon. Number yeah. seven plays for the Gators. I know his uncle. I know their. I mean, I know his dad. I played with his uncle. So, yeah, I've got to support him. All right. I, I'm going to take Florida there as well. Uh, I think they are the team to beat in the East right now. And you got Kyle Trask and then uh, Kyle Pitts. Man, just unbelievable. I don't think anybody can stop Pitts. I, I, he's a matchup nightmare. Nobody can run with him. So, uh, even though South Carolina's playing a little bit better, I got to go with the Gators, and I got to go Gators big. All right, Texas, who claimed it, they are back versus TCU. Glenn, who you got? Is Texas really saying that? They've been saying it every year. <laughs> it all started when they they uh, somehow beat uh, Georgia in the Sugar Bowl a couple of years when Jake Fromm was was the quarterback. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I I actually think Texas playing good ball is, is is good for college football as a whole. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to say Texas, Marvin. Uh, I'm going to go with the referees. Uh, they're getting the check, so they're going to be the biggest winners in that game. <laughs> the well, it's, definitely, it's definitely not for anybody who likes defense because it doesn't exist in the, the Big 12. So, it does not. Uh, I, I agree with Glenn. I, I got to go with Texas just because, you know, a story program winning and being back on top is great for football. Uh, plus, I like Sam Ellinger. I, I think that he's one of the better quarterbacks in the country. Not the best because he plays for us. Oh, All right. man, hold on real quick. Shout out. Uh, one of my good friends, Aaron Harris, he was the starting middle linebacker on Texas last time they won a national championship. Don't you still owe me $100 from the last bet we made by the game? So I know you're watching. <laughs> I'm going to need you to come see me about that. Uh, or if you want to talk to Marvin, we got uh... – an email address, uh, the constant, the Riley constant show at gmail.com. Uh, we can take that or we can set up a Venmo account. So, you know, we're here to accommodate. <laughs> All right. Uh, number 12, North Carolina Tar Heels versus Boston college. Who you got Glenn? Uh, I, yeah, I got, I got, a, I got a pass on that one. I have no clue. I'm going to take North Carolina off the strength of Mac Brown. Actually, going yeah. to those guys to play a lot harder than they've been playing. So, yeah, definitely got them playing at a high level. I like that defense. The defense has a lot of NFL prospects right now. <laughs> I like the way they're playing. I like their quarterback. Um, so, I'm going to go with the Tar Heels there too. All right, jump back to the SEC off a of fresh opening week win. The North, the Tennessee Volunteers versus Missouri. Glenn, who you got? 
Marvin? I'm going to go with Tennessee. I'm going to follow that. Love what Jeremy Pruitt is doing. I, I think he's going to get them back to being what Tennessee fans are accustomed to. Uh, like their quarterback who's playing better, Garantano, looking a little bit better. Plus that running game. Uh, Gray is looking like he's going to be a stud for the East. So going with the Volunteers. All right. The surprise of the SEC, Mississippi State, who is ranked number 16th this week versus Bacon Bits. I mean, Arkansas. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, state. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going to take state. <laughs> All right. Uh, now I got. I got to cut you off. I got to cut you off. No, Did you say Gray is looking? Gray is looking real good. Yeah, that's what. Well, okay. that's what ESPN's telling us. He came to a. He came to a camp, and um, he was at Bama for a couple of days, and. Mm. I don't think I've ever seen a running back his size be so smooth out of, as a receiver out of the backfield. And it was yeah. it was to the point that I wondered if he could ever really be a true running back. So I, I, I'm i going to have to look him up and see how he's doing. Hey, he's into it. He really turned uh, on the later part of last year and looks like he's picking up where he left off. So he's okay. definitely one that to keep a watch on this year, not only, not only on the SEC, but a national level. Um uh, uh, my pick, of course, Mississippi State. I don't see Arkansas come up with anything that can remotely slow them down right now. So, the Bulldogs, number one, Clemson versus Virginia. Glenn. I oh, mean, I'm, I'm just going to go with Clemson. Marvin. I don't even know why they're playing this game. Uh, they because <laughs> <laughs> it's the ACC. It's the homecoming conference. Yeah, this is the game. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going Clemson as well. Uh, all right, the LSU Tigers who are trying to recover and lick their wounds versus Vandy. Glenn. Uh, uh, LSU. There's no way they're going to they gonna drop the ball again. You know, anyway. If they lose to Vandy, they have to get kicked out of the SEC, so I'm going to go with LSU. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going with LSU too just because I'm afraid of what Coach O would do to his players should they lose. <laughs> All right, uh, one of the uh, games of the weekend, number four, Georgia versus those other guys down the road, Auburn. <laughs> Glenn, who you got? Uh, I think Georgia. Mm. It's just it, – it, it, you can't be around saving that long and not know how to rebound. You know, so I think Georgia. Yeah. What do you think, Marvin? I'm going to pick Georgia. I will never pick those other guys. I don't care who they're playing. They could be playing first graders. I'm still going to pick the first graders. <laughs> I'm right there, too. I'm going to go with Georgia. Um, I think it really comes down to the quarterback situation here. Not really sure if JT Daniels is going to play this week, even though he has been cleared. Uh, but the uh, guy, I forgot his name. The guy who played last week in relief actually looked pretty good. And I'm sorry, I'm not on the Bo Nix train. At Auburn, I don't think he's really that good, even though they're trying to make us believe it. So, I'm going with Ugga on this one. All right. The game that all of us are really watching. Number two, Alabama versus number 13, Texas A&M. First home game at Bryant-Denny. Glenn, what you got? Bama. Would you, would you judge me if I didn't say Bama? Would you judge me? Man, I'm not going to throw the stones, but you can't come back. <laughs> <laughs> no, brother. I, I, we're all about real. We're all about realness there, you know. Uh, no, nah, Bama, Bama for sure. Bama for sure. <laughs> I mean, Marvin, you already know my answer to this. So I'm gonna say Bama by 24. Oh, hey, that's a lot. Man. Oh yeah, I think it's gonna get ugly. I think you're gonna see that team actually finish a game. I don't think Saban's gonna let them play back-to-back -back weeks without finishing games. I think they'll come out strong in the first half, and yeah. he's going to chew their asses at halftime. Yeah. <laughs> make it even harder the second half. So I yeah. think it'll be total domination from, from minute one to minute 60. Uh, I'm definitely uh, watching this game. Uh, you know, my question is uh, what Kellen Mond is going to show up. This is a guy who's probably one of the most inconsistent quarterbacks to have the most promise uh, his whole, whole career at A&M. So my question is, is he going to show up against us? I honestly don't feel like that he's going to be able to use his legs against this rejuvenated defense, uh, especially Dylan Moses playing at the level of uh, basically as Ray Lewis used to put, uh, pissed off for greatness. 
And I feel that's the way Dylan Moses is playing right now. Uh, plus, I believe that A&M's got a lot of players out due to COVID and then injuries too. They had their top wide receiver, Osmond, decide to opt out. They still got a good running back and Spiller. But I still feel like Alabama is going to get that first win uh, of the season at home, uh, rolling with the tide. So we'll definitely have to revisit and see who got the most right this week. So I think, Marvin, you're in the lead right now with the most picks <laughs> from last week. So Hey, you, I'm going to stay in the lead. Hey, we, we might have to get one of those WWE belts for the winner <laughs> each week to carry around. <laughs> All right. Before we completely sign off, we got a few notes here. Uh, Marvin, uh, first of all, this promote your book. How is your book, Physical and Mental Fitness at 40 Plus, doing? By the way, if you want to buy it, link is on our website. And Marvin, you can tell us how we can get it from Amazon and other places. The book's actually doing very well. Um, I'm actually surprised at how well it's doing, but. Um, I didn't think that the outpouring would be as strong as it has been, but, you know, I'm, I'm thankful and I'm blessed that it is because, you know, when you look at the situation, you know, once you're in your forties, again, people swear you're over the hill. And I look around at most people who are my age and they look over the hill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, Marvin, we lost your audio. Oh, oh man, I get, I get. <laughs> we gotta promote this. We can't give up. Can, yeah. can, let's try it again, Marvin. This, this Xfinity situation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, but he he said there's no way that I'm over forty, and I'm like, well, I'm You're actually right. forty-one. But I mean, because it goes back to how well you take care of yourself. You're so right. basically, it's just a tool that people can use to really take care of. Themselves. Have you received yours yet? I have not. No, actually, I got – no, I got the notification Friday. They got shipped out on Friday, and I ordered it the week before. Well, if you didn't get it today, you should have it by tomorrow. Oh, I, I understand. You know how this postal service is right now with, with COVID. and oh, shipping delays. Like, why? Like, oh, it's insane. It. Man. All right. Uh, sticking with, uh, with books and reading, I guess. Uh, you can check out my latest article still available on our website, uh, Never Give Up, the story of Alabama legend Kevin Jackson. Pretty awesome story if you didn't get a chance to listen to our podcast a few weeks back. Excellent guest. Thank you, Marvin, for bringing him on. Definitely a great testimonial from him. Um, if you have any questions about our next show or for us, you can email us at the Riley and Constant Show at gmail.com. Uh, before we get to closing, Marvin, can you tell us what next week holds for us as far as guests? I was going to ask you that. Well, I didn't want to steal any thunder, but I can tell you who one of them is. Go for it. <laughs> Man, I appreciate that honor. Man, I'm really excited uh, to have one of our guests coming back to, uh, to uh, one of our podcasts, and more importantly, to our podcast. He is a man who has one of the most actually two of the most recognized plays in football history started in 1992 with the strip. And I, even after saying that, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. And then uh, the other one was when he defended the star and took out T.O. The man, George T. Man, really excited to add him back. I believe Marvin's going to have a, a partner for him in that show. Is that right? Marvin, who, who's going to be joining George? Hey, you know, George Teague's a great guy. I'm looking forward to it. Well, who, who do you have coming with him? I think you had a special guest that was going to join us with him. Well, he hadn't responded back yet to confirm uh, if it'll work. It'll, it'll happen. I'll tell George to get on it. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, George has him on his show right after hours tonight. So. Uh. <laughs> So that maybe that's why he didn't respond to my message earlier. <laughs> we will have a third guest on this show as well. Ooh, see, guys, this is why you got to tune in every week because we I, have the, the I'll best. Tell, I'll tell you who it is, though. He didn't play football. What? He didn't play football, but he's a big yeah. Alabama fan. He's a very famous comedian. <laughs> Uh, is he coming back to us? 
Or Guess who it, coming back? Oh, okay. I, I thought you going. You're talking about your cousin. No, no, no. Comedian Steve Brown. He's been on Def Comedy Jam. Oh, wow. Yeah, BET's Comic View. Steve Brown is going to join us next Tuesday. Man, <laughs> I'm excited that the guests keep getting better and better. Uh, oh, definitely. Yeah. He's, he's a big time Alabama fan, man. So, you know, I, I had to invite him. You know, we were talking about some other stuff and I just said, come on, man, let's go. And he said, okay. He's family. And I saw the picture of him holding your book too. So yeah. I know, I know he's, he's excited to get to have that in his hand as well. All right. Um, all right. Uh, let's get some closing remarks. Glenn, uh, before we go, kind of give us uh, your ending remarks, but also uh, talk to us about your book and then how we can get a hold of that. Um, I feel like you can get it on Amazon and stuff like that. My pops know more than me. Uh, but um, how, how can you get it at? Where can you get it? Come on, you got to give us this info. Cause see, I'm gonna support you. <laughs> I'm gonna support you. See, but we need the info. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, there's more to life than the pursuit of money. Is is uh, is the name of the book. Uh, I think you can get it on Amazon. You can find it. If you look for it, you'll find it. Can okay. I say that? Is that is that fine? Is that fine? That that that'll work. We'll, we'll, we'll that'll track work. It down. We'll track it down. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll get the link and we'll post it on our website as well. So you'll okay. be side by side with Marvin and Sherman Williams. So great company there. So um, how can we get in touch with you on social media? Are you on any platforms right now? No, nah, man. Like I. I literally spend my Saturdays by going to the coffee shop and reading and reading books. Like uh, I, I'm not on any social media. I'm on it, but I don't. I don't. I'm not on it. On it, you know. I have a Facebook, but I don't check it. But probably three times a year. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really on social media. Okay. If we know, if we need to get a hold of you, we we know where to find you. We'll bring you right back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marvin. How can people reach you? I'm easy to find. Social media, Instagram, Constant45. Uh, my Twitter is Constant451. Facebook, I'm just Marvin Constant. I'm easy to find. You know, uh, If you've got any questions about anything in life, I'm here. Just ask. <laughs> All right, guys, great show. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much again for coming on. It really means a lot. Uh, not only as an Alabama fan, but to, ha to have you here, because like I said, you're one of my favorite players to watch, uh, but also hearing your testimony, hearing your message, uh, hearing the things that Christ has done in your life and what he continues to do. It just really means a lot to me, and it meant a lot to me to get you here and to also carry that message out to our audi audience, and that, that's the most important part. So, yeah, thank you again so much for coming on, and Marvin, thank you for bringing on uh, such a great guest. Hey, 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 no problem. Hey, Glenn. Yeah. Thank you for coming, brother. Man. It was oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I, and I got to tell you, A Day got canceled this year. But you know what? You know where to find us at next A Day. What's up? I got you. I got you. You know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. Okay. Hey, I'm going to make sure this is a real good one. Since we had to miss a year, I'm going to make sure this next one is it's phenomenal. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Oh. Uh, all right, I'm gonna hold you to that now. Uh, don't hey, listen, doubt him. You you know Brandon Brooks. Brandon works with me on this. So Brandon has pretty much took over now, and I'm Brandon's assistant now. So we flip flop roles. So and Brandon, he's going above and beyond. So I love his plans, man. Y'all are really gonna enjoy what Brandon has in store. Cool, 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 cool. Don't Sorry. don't doubt him, Glenn, because if you do, it's only gonna fuel his fire even more, and he's gonna go <laughs> even more over the top. <laughs> he might even have Bruno Mars show up. I, I feel like Marvin would do that. I ain't no telling what we can get done. <laughs> All right. Again, a great time with you guys, man. Uh, awesome time. Uh, guys, uh, if you can find me on Twitter at Justin Riley 7, on Instagram at Justin Riley underscore 7. Also, you can reach us at the Sportscast on Twitter at the Sportscast 1. Same thing for Instagram or visit us on the Sportscast dot net all right guys let's send everybody out the right way roll tide roll tide <laughs>